So today we're going to be talking about 10 ways that can help you better deal with the feeling of emotional abandonment. Click subscribe and hit the notification bell. You'll be notified every time I upload a new video. When you like the video, you help to tell YouTube that you find this information helpful. Thank you. So one of the most difficult things that anyone will have to heal in their adult lifetime on the path to emotional recovery is the wound of abandonment. When you suffer the wound of abandonment, it is literally like you have been cut off from love. All children are born to bond and to feel in synchronicity with the mothership that has created them. And we are biologically driven on a cellular level to connect with and to feel one with, especially our mothers. And this is not to say that fathers don't play an important role because they certainly do. And this is not to say that if you don't feel rejected physically and or emotionally by a father figure, that you will not suffer abandonment issues either. That's not what this session is all about. I would like to focus specifically on what it feels like to suffer the abandonment wound of a mother and what it will do to us on an emotional and even physical level when we feel as if love has been denied us. It is absolutely incredibly important for every child to feel attuned with their mother's energy. And like I said, in this session, we're focusing on the mother figure. It is absolutely crucial for a child to feel one with, especially their mother and or a caretaker that assumes responsibility for their consistent care. In the mind of a child, they must decide that the world is a safe place. When we grow up and we feel that the world is a hostile place, we remain in states of hypervigilance. We remain in states of survival. We have a difficult time trusting people. And if we tend to isolate due to us feeling so alone as children, and it is not uncommon for someone who has suffered an abandonment wound, who felt rejected by their family, who was forced to deal with things alone, it is not uncommon to become an adult who prefers to isolate, an adult who feels like people are a threat. And so if you are someone like myself who spent a lot of time alone because being with the family was painful, criticisms, rejections, sarcasm, you name it, if you were forced to live alone as a child and to figure out things on your own as a child, don't be surprised if it's difficult for you as an adult to ask for help, if it's difficult for you to reach out, and if it feels safer for you to figure things out on your own. It's not uncommon. It's essentially a mirror to how you dealt with problems as a child, and that's certainly not your fault. All children enter into this time and space needing to learn that the world is a safe place. They receive that information by the way they are treated in their environment. So a newborn knows when they are happy and when they are unhappy. When a newborn cries and people respond and the child's needs are met, the child develops a sense of faith and trust in the external world. When a child's needs are continually frustrated, the child gets the feeling that this is not a safe place. Deeper, a child gets a sense that they have no control over their exterior environment. So a sense of distrust and even powerlessness develops in the soul being of the child. If this goes on indefinitely, and certainly past the age of three, children don't develop a healthy sense of self. Their worlds are unpredictable. Their worlds are unsafe they are unable to form and maintain a healthy perception of self. When children are brought up in homes uh, where there is chaos, there's unpredictability, mom has a difficult time managing her emotions, dad is reactive, mom is reactive to dad, mom and dad are obsessed with one another, they ignore the needs of the children, there's no one stepping in to protect the well-being of the children in the home 
children are forced to live in a state of survival. They are not interested in what do I think and what do I feel. They have to be concerned about what's happening outside of them. And without a child being able to look within long enough and without a healthy mom or a healthy dad or a healthy, a healthy adult on the outside, reinforcing, what do you think, Johnny? How do you feel, Susan? What would you like to do today? The me that I am, I associate with my eyes, what I see. So if mommy loves me, then I must be lovable. So my eyes are very important. What I see in my external world and also what I see mirroring back to me from the eyes of the people that are raising me is just as important. So our physical eyes are really, really intrinsic to how we feel about the self, what we see, what we pick up on. And this external eye, the eye that we see, the external world in becomes an internal eye. It becomes the viewer and perceiver of how I see the self. So if I don't have enough people in the outer world worrying about how I feel, I am not, my brain is not encoded with how do I feel. The brain is programmable, but don't forget it's come with a bunch of DNA codes and a code is a program. And an open minder thinker says, well, who created the code in the DNA that's responsible for my liver, for my brain, for my brain stem, for my heart, for my pancreas, and who is, and who is responsible for the intelligence that makes all of these organs work together. All of this information is programmed into our DNA, which is fabulous. But when you enter a physical time space reality, such as earth, your earthly parents, your earthly environment also layers your base programming. And this evolves into your personality and the personality can be shifted based on what the personality or what the being themselves continues to rehearse in their mind. One of the things that I love about working with adult children of alcoholics and adult children of narcissistic parents is the moment when they begin to realize that their base program is good, it's even godly if you say, it's spiritual in nature. However, what went wrong was not them, it was their second layer of programming. The program they received when they entered this time and space. The program that has been corrupted by the immature, emotion, emotionally immature parents that raised them, or the alcoholic parents that raised them, the narcissistic parents that raised them the parents who emotionally abandoned them and worse. That's what has affected the second layer of programming. And if we can break through that second layer of programming, then we can get to the base layer of program, which, program, which is, wait a minute, I am enough, I've always been enough, and this becomes the new jumping off place. But the journey from being unaware to aware of the problem, the deconstructing of the problem, is where I like to help people. It's where I create tools to help people know exactly how to do that. And I would like to offer you some of those tools today. If you're interested in learning more about how you can do that and deconstruct the actual problem so you can decode the problem and solve the problem, go to my website at www.lisaaromano.com and go to my store and you can see many, many courses, programs, and workbooks that I've created for people who are really curious about how can I break through this earthly program and get to the base program, which is I am enough. How do I work in that space? What tools do I need to better my life? In this session, I'm going to offer you 10 key ideas that you can use to help you heal the feeling of abandonment and help you return to the self and remember that you are enough. Remember that has to be your new base springing off place. So number one is that we want to acknowledge that there has been abandonment in the first place. Many adult children of alcoholics and even adult children of narcissists, even narcissists tend to idealize their childhoods. They will tell you that everything was perfect. I think part of that for an ACOA, for instance, is because they have been taught that what stays, what happens in this house stays in this house. They have been taught that their parents are doing the best that they could. They've heard their parents offer them a ton of excuses. They've heard their parents say, 
Look, look how good you have it. You have no idea how hard my life was. And so there is almost a justification for the emotional abandonment, the lack of care in the house, the lack of attention the children get, the missed meals, the no food in the refrigerator, and the various forms of abuse. Really, really dysfunctional parents will tell their children or try to brainwash their children into thinking nothing was wrong. And that literally becomes a program, nothing was wrong. So the first thing that you want to do is if your inner being is telling you that you feel like you struggle with abandonment, trust it. So acknowledge that even if your parents were there every day, if they weren't emotionally attuned to you, if you felt like there was a pane of glass between you and them, they, for whatever reason, were unable to convince you or to reach you on the level in which you needed. It doesn't matter why, just acknowledge that this is in fact the case. This will allow you to heal much faster in the acknowledgement of this is just how I feel. The second thing that you want to do is you want to look straight in the face of the shame that gets created when someone feels abandoned. You want to look at it head on. You don't want to want to run away from it. You want to say the result of feeling abandoned caused the effect of shame. The world as we know it is cause and effect, like it or not. I didn't create the paradigm. I didn't create the rules that govern time and space. I just try to decode them. I try to understand them and I try to work within them to the best of my physical, mental, and emotional, spiritual ability. When you look at shame, shame begins to dissipate. When you run from shame, you actually reinforce shame. So step one is you acknowledge that there was an abandonment, there was a cause, and you weren't the cause, you were the effect. The abandonment was the effect. The cause is your mother, your father's emotional abandonment. The emotional effect is shame. You have the state of being of shame, which is I am defective. Most children of adult children of alcoholics and most children of narcissistic parents and emotionally immature parents assume blame for why mommy drinks. They assume blame for why daddy is mean to them. They assume blame for why mommy left me or mommy abandoned me when I was five. They assume the blame for that. And that blame creates shame. And so the second part of this process is you want to look at the shame and go, wait a minute, it wasn't my fault that I felt this abandonment. That's very, very helpful. The shame that I feel is the effect of this cause of feeling abandoned. So let's say, for instance, I recently coached someone who said that their mother literally left she and her sister when she was five and her sister was six. This feeling of abandonment at five years old, when the brain is in a theta brainwave state, downloading information rapidly, this little baby assumed it was her fault that maybe it was because she got out of bed in the middle of the night and asked mommy for a glass of water. Or maybe it was the night before when she had a tummy ache. Or maybe it was the night before when she gave her mom a hard time about going to kindergarten. And so these very limited ideas due to the state of a child's consciousness at five still affected this baby and she carried shame her entire life and as an adult struggled with abandonment issues and never made the connection to the past. So on this, in this process, you want to see the shame, you would acknowledge the shame, and you would tell the shame, you're here, but it's not your fault that you're here, nor is it my fault that you're here. The third step is you want to try to figure out how does the feeling of abandonment show up in your life? A, do you chase love? Are you codependent? Do you seek approval? Are you highly agreeable? Do you fear confrontation? And ask yourself, in all of my people-pleasing and fawning and enabling, am I trying to avoid having to set a boundary which will threaten my attachment to this person and possibly cause them to leave me? Very important that you, that you figure out, you follow this through, because there's an experience, there's an emotion, there's a belief, and then there's an action. You're trying to figure out the experience, the belief, the emotions, the actions you're now taking in a 3D world unconsciously. The second thing that lots of us do when we struggle with abandonment is that we run from love. We have really strict, rigid boundaries. We don't trust people very much. We put our friends and our family through the ringer. We put our partners through the ringer. We're like, 
testing them. We want to see just how far we can push them before they, they will abandon us. Sometimes we just decide that, nope, relationships are too scary. And that is the fear of abandonment showing up in that behavior in the 3D world. We have decided that it's just too scary and it's just, I feel too vulnerable if I share myself and I would feel safer. Remember, your brain is designed for safety. Doesn't matter if it prevents your spiritual and emotional growth. The brain is not concerned about that. Your brain is designed for safety as is your personality. Your base emotional, your base spiritual code is love, but we've got to get you back there. But your personality code, that is the result of yes, nature, but also what's happened to you in the nurturing environment or the lack of nurturing environment. We're trying to figure that out. We're trying to decode it, but you might be someone who isolates and says, Nope, relationships are painful. I want nothing to do with it. And you might find many ways to block intimacy. Maybe you will go to bed after your spouse goes to sleep. Maybe you will leave the house before your spouse gets up from work. Maybe you won't respond to a text very quickly because you know your, your spouse wants you to. Maybe you decide that you're not going to give too much to your children emotionally, because if you love them too much, they can abandon you. And eventually they do grow up and leave the nest. So it's funny ways in which our fears that were created in childhood that are associated with abandonment show up outside our conscious awareness. Another thing that the next thing that we want to do step four is you want to identify the false beliefs that are associated with your fears of abandonment. Some of those false beliefs you will notice in your self-talk. Do you have negative self-talk? Any negative self-talk you want to catch like you're catching in a butterfly net so that you can observe them. Remember what we need to do is decode the problem and then find a way to solve the problem. But you have to deconstruct the problem in order to solve the problem. Your negative self-talk is a physical manifestation of abandonment issues. Nothing works out for me. I'm not enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm too old. Everyone else is lucky. I'm just not lucky. This wasn't supposed to be. No one in my family ever achieved anything. Why do I think I should achieve something? So pay attention to the negative self-talk and see if you can catch those negative self statements and then write them down in a journal. The fifth step is that you want to actively and deliberately, this is you taking affirmative action in the 3d world to change your subconscious program. You need to replace the negative self-talk. So I am not enough becomes I am enough. Things never work out for me becomes things are working out for me. I hate life or I hate people or I hate myself becomes I love myself. I'm learning to love people and I'm so grateful for my life. Even if you have to fake it, you fake it until you can make it. And let's face it. These steps are only going to prove beneficial for the person who's sick and tired of being sick and tired. These steps, if someone works them can absolutely help someone change their life, but you have to be someone who's willing to be uncomfortable with an unknown, uncomfortable with new thoughts, uncomfortable being in between realities. You are literally leaving one reality and you're stepping into the unknown and creating a new reality. And if you do it long enough, you create a second reality, sort of like how I reinvented myself. My first marriage was an absolute mirror to my childhood. I spent considerable time alone. I made a lot of mistakes in the dating scene, but with every mistake, I learned something more about myself and I just kept rising and rising and rising in my consciousness until finally, when I figured it out, I have to love myself. I returned to love. I created a new reality for myself on the inside and then I attracted the reality that I'm living now with my husband, Anthony. And so if I can do it, you can do it too. So you have to be willing to be uncomfortable in between realities as you're stringing together new thoughts, new feelings, new beliefs, and new energies. And eventually that will manifest as a new life experience. Number six, you have to start talking to the wounded inner child. I mean, literally start talking to your inner child. And so rather than looking outside of you, rather than wanting someone else to validate you, rather than using people pleasing to make sure people don't get angry at you, rather than do 
all of this, these codependent behaviors in the 3D world, you start to close your eye, your physical eye to this type of behavior and you use your inner eye to focus on your inner child. You connect to your heart space and start talking to your inner child. It sounds similar to what do you want? What do you think? How do you feel? This is literally the crucible of your soul. We've got to get your mind and your brain and all the neurons of your brain to start creating a more positive perception of self. Seeing yourself as innocent and being affected by the external world and then acknowledging accountability as part of the healing process, how these experiences shaped your personality shaped your egos and shaped your ego defense mechanism. And if you can do that objectively, you can definitely heal from any abandonment issue that is plaguing you thus far. So you want to really start talking to your inner child. The seventh thing that you can do is to get a picture of your younger self. Some of the clients that I have that come through the 12 week breakthrough coaching program and the emotional mastery masterclass, Sometimes they tell us that they have no pictures of them as children and that's super, super sad. However, let's say you want to work with your inner child and you don't have any family photos. That's okay. Pick any photo off the internet of a little child that warms your heart. Look through online photos. There are so many different websites that you can look through and see if you can capture the picture of a little girl or a little boy that resembles you and try to see if you can get one that you resonate with and print the picture out and put it in a frame. This is the picture or the image that you want to look at every day because that will help you con to connect to your feeling space rather than stay stuck in patterns and programs of taking care of everybody else but yourself. This picture and the 3D world serves as a reminder. Remember, your eye is very important. What you look at is very important because what you're looking at is something that you absorb. So if you have a picture of your inner child or a photo of a child that reminds you of your inner child, you're seeing innocence. You're developing compassion and empathy for the self, which are very important heart-based strong healing emotions. So get a picture of your inner child. Now, number eight. You have to stay in the world of reality. Now, when we are operating below the veil of consciousness, we idealize people. We can even idealize ourselves. We idealize our childhoods. Sometimes we think that we're more qualified than we actually are. And in some cases, we think our relationships are a lot healthier than they are. In some of the cases, we think that we are a lot healthier than, they, than we actually are. So we want to start living in the world of reality, seeing things as they are, not as we want them to be. That's very childlike. That's magical thinking. All children imagine life the way they want it to be and they think that they can change it. And so if mommy's drunk, they don't know that mommy's drunk. They know that mommy's not attentive. They know that mommy's upset. They know that mommy isn't paying attention to them. They know that mommy's angry. And in a child's mind, a child goes right into phantasmical thinking, fantasy like thinking, whimsical thinking. Well, if I go over there and brush mommy's hair, then she'll love me. And then the child goes over and tries to brush mommy's hair and mommy pushes the child away. The child goes right into feeling like it's their fault, the shame, they blame themselves. And this becomes a pattern. And so what we want to do is we want to break through whimsical thinking and start to see things as they really are. So in this step, what you're going to do again, you're going to get out your journal. I'm a big journaling freak. I journal about everything. It is just fabulous. And if you'd like to learn more about my 21 day inner child healing adventure, I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. You get out your journal and you journal about who you can trust and who you can't trust in a 3d world, who in your life throughout your history, past and present, who are the people that you feel like you can trust and who are the people that have proven to you that you cannot trust them. Then you want to ask yourself, well, have I ignored the fact that I can't trust Mary? And do I keep seeking Mary's approval? Mary could be an older sister. She could be a neighbor. She could be a boss. Oftentimes adult children of alcoholics tend to repeat the child patterns from childhood in office situations and in spousal situations and in adult friendships. 
So a narcissistic boss takes on the qualities or the nuance of the narcissistic mother that abandoned you or the alcoholic mother who was never there for you or a stepdaughter who is codependent on your husband takes on the nuance of your mother and the, your father take your husband takes on the nuance of the father that would never listen to you. It's very, very interesting. So you want to get clear about how are you showing up when it comes to these people that you can trust and you don't trust. It is not uncommon for many adult children of alcoholics to not appreciate enough the people that we can trust. It seems like we are, we have a compulsion to fix what went wrong in childhood. So we might have two or three really awesome friends who have been there for us, but we seem to, we seem to be focused on the one person that continues to make us feel less than. It's almost like we have to prove to them that we're okay. We have to gain their validation. It's repetition compulsion. It's the child in me that still feels so wounded and abandoned and still on some level thinks that, that I need the energy of that person to accept me. And it comes from a very wounded place. Once you have identified how you show up in these relationships and you're pretty clear about it, and let's face it, it might take you a week, two weeks, a month, a couple of months to figure out like how does do these abandonment issues show up in my relationships. But once you get in the habit of making these connections, it does get easier. So the next step then would be to start setting boundaries for yourself and other people. So let's say that there's a friend in your group that tends to make fun of you and she puts you down and she ignores you and you feel it. You feel like she kind of enjoys making you feel less than. So rather than chase after approval, if that's something that you've always done, you stop seeking her approval. You stop tolerating it. You stop hanging out with her. You start setting boundaries. You start acknowledging, wow, this is how it makes me feel. You look to the inner child and you say, I see you. I know how that behavior has made you feel and I am not going to tolerate. Your higher self is not going to tolerate it. So what am I going to do? Step into the parent role, step into the protective role. You know what? We're going to spend less time with her. And if she asks us why, maybe I'll have the conversation with her. And you know what, whether she likes the conversation or doesn't like the conversation, that's up to her. But if we, you and a child and I are going to hang out with this person, things have to change. So you're developing this ability to acknowledge how you feel and using this concept of the inner child, it will conceptualize it for you and make it easier for you to understand what you're doing. Then you also have to understand that you are literally in the process of reparenting yourself. You are literally in the process of being both a nurturer and a protector of yourself. Now, this doesn't mean that our boundaries remain rigid. We don't have to have rigid boundaries once we learn to love the self. You can move into a place of this is what I think and this is how I feel and I care about you and I want this to be a reciprocal type relationship. Um, but moving forward, I'm not going to chase approval. I'm not going to tolerate bad behavior and I don't necessarily want to isolate so much anymore. So that means that I'm going to have to be okay being me if this resonates with you. So you want to learn to start setting boundaries once you've identified the people in your life that you can trust and you can't trust. This 10th step is where you start trusting yourself a little bit more. So rather than looking to the outside world for safety, rather than saying to yourself, things have to be exactly this way in order for me to feel safe, you find that sense of safety within yourself. You're learning to take care of yourself. You're learning to listen to yourself. You're learning to honor yourself. Self-care is huge. My life really began to change when I adopted these ideas and I realized that if I just took all of this energy that I put and I placed it on my friends and my ex-husband and my mom and all of the energy that I put into people pleasing and fawning and trying to be good enough, if I took all of that energy and instead placed it on myself, love myself, exercise, eat well, journal, meditate, sit out in the sun, read a book that warms my soul, work on my own emotional mastery. If I took all of that energy and just said, it is what it is. It's a creation. It's here. I can't do anything about what's here now, but all my power truly is in the now. And if I began to self care, my life would have to change. 
as you begin to love yourself and you practice self-love, remember self-care is self-love in action. And as you begin to self-care, you're loving yourself. As you're talking to your inner child day in and day in, day night, I love you, I love you, you are enough, you are enough, you are enough, you are enough, I see you, I feel you. What would you like to do today? How did that make you feel? What do you think we should do? You have conversations with your inner being. It's very, very helpful. Although some people might say, no, it's bonkers. In my opinion, it's very, very helpful and it's helped, helped me. It helps us integrate. So developing this idea of the inner child is really super, super, super beneficial. And so as you're on this path, guess what happens? You start to trust yourself. You start to feel like you've merged in a whole new way. There's a self-actualization process that begins to take shape. There's the self-reliance, self-resilience. You're not attached to the outside anymore. And as you stay on this path, you trust yourself more and more and more and more. You don't need and crave people so much anymore. So that pushes your relationships more into an authentic realm. Now you're able to want relationships. Now you can rely on yourself. And now you're even more able to decide with a clear mind who you can trust and who you can't trust. Because as long as you're operating below the veil of consciousness, as long as the wounds are, are responsible for the actions that you're taking, you're probably going to trust people you shouldn't trust. And you're probably going to fawn and chase after people's approval to avoid abandonment, or you're going to continue to shut yourself off from what might be beautiful, intimate relationships with people you actually can trust. If this idea of the inner child resonates with you, I'd like you to know that I've just created a 21 day journaling adventure for those of you who are interested in healing the inner child. For less than a dollar a day, you can work inside this journaling program. Every day you receive a new lesson and a new prompt, and you also get a self-care recovery checklist to work with, and it's yours to keep. You can find out more by going to my website and or clicking the link below. Namaste, everybody. Until next time, remember, you are enough. Hey, Bye if you love now. this content, don't forget to check out the next video, and you can go to my website and take the codependency quiz.